Welcome to the first section of our bacteria chapter. This is our bacteria overview figure. We'll be using this throughout all of our videos as a roadmap. So in this video, we'll be discussing Clostridium tetani, which you can see right here. This scene is about a necromancer who's tethered to the gates of hell. During his mortal life, he rubbed shoulders with some pretty shady people and was banished to the underworld. Notice that he's chained to the gate behind him, which is the entrance to this hellish underworld. The orange looking flames behind the gate should remind you that he's in hell. So tethered for tetani, or clostridium tetani. Notice that most of the background is purple. This is because clostridium tetani is a gram-positive organism, and gram-positive organisms stain purple under the microscope. We'll use this consistently throughout our microbiology videos to represent gram-positive organisms, and we'll use a lot of red and pink colors in the background to represent gram-negative organisms. This is a figure differentiating gram-positive organisms from gram-negative organisms. The purple circles right here represent gram-positive cocci, and the pink rods right here are gram-negative bacilli. Clostridium tetani is a gram-positive rod, so it looks kind of like this when gram-stained. So it's purple, and it looks kind of like rods, as you can see by these shapes right here. Okay, notice that the necromancer is raising the skeleton monster from the dead. Look at the skeleton's back. Do you see how it's kind of in an arched shape? This is because Clostridium tetani infection causes spasms of the spinal extensor muscles, resulting in this arched back appearance. Also notice how there is a green cloud of magic around the skeleton. This looks like a green gas cloud, which is used to represent an exotoxin. Clostridium tetani produces an exotoxin known as tetanospasm, which causes muscle contractions. I'll talk more about this toxin in a minute. If you look at the necromancer's hand, you can see that he has the same green magic looking cloud around him as if he's casting a spell on the skeleton. Also notice that he's using dice to help him with his dark magic. The dice in this green cloud of magic represents diazepam because dice sounds kind of like diazepam. Diazepam is a benzodiazepine that can be used to reduce the muscle spasms seen in Clostridium tetani. Did you notice anything odd about the skeleton monster's jaw? It's missing. In fact, it's at the bottom of his coffin. He's been dead for about 10,000 years though, so I guess your bones start to decay after a while. Also notice that there is a lock on the side of the skeleton's coffin. The lock and the jaw together should help you remember that Clostridium tetani can cause lock jaw, which is also known as trismus. We'll also add some bugs to the scene because you'd likely have bugs in your coffin after a few thousand years. Notice that these are snails. A snail has an outer shell that protects it, and similarly, spores produced by bacteria have a sturdy protective covering, making them highly resistant to chemicals and temperature. This allows bacteria to survive in harsh environments for a very long time. Spores are inactive, but can become metabolically active when environmental conditions are favorable. So we think a pretty good representation of this is an object with an outer shell. In this case, a snail. So snail for spore forming. Throughout our videos, we'll continue to use snails and other objects with outer shells to represent spores. Okay, let's add another character to the scene. This monster to the right is also being raised from the dead, but it's taking a bit more effort because he's strapped down with these cords. As the powerful magic begins to exert its force on the monsters and their coffins are violently ripped open, a black cloud of dust begins to rise to the sky. This dust cloud at the bottom left side of the image along with the belly ring monster, allude to the idea that unhygienic deliveries and umbilical cord care can be associated with Clostridium tetani. So think of this big belly ring strapped down with dirty ropes and dust flying in the air as a representation of a dirty umbilical cord. Notice that this monster has a mask on. The mask alludes to the idea that this is an obligate anaerobic organism. A mask covers the mouth and nose, making it harder to breathe, just like anaerobic organisms must grow in environments with little oxygen. In future images, will represent obligate anaerobes with face masks. So face mask for obligate anaerobe. We've also added a creepy looking smile on this monster to help you remember that Clostridium tetani causes rhesus sardonicus, which is characterized by an eerie looking grin. Finally, notice that this monster has some horns. This is a reference to how the tetanus toxin works. It travels to the anterior horn of the spinal cord. So horn for anterior horn of the spinal cord. This whole process can be a bit hard to visualize, so let's pull up a figure to make things easier. This is an overview figure of tetanospasm, which can be found in section one of bacteria. When a foreign object with tetani spores punctures the skin, the organism vegetates at the wound site and produces tetanus toxin, or tetanospasm, which you can see right here. The toxin then travels through the motor neuron from the periphery to the anterior horn of the spinal cord, so like this. 
This type of movement going from the periphery to the spinal cord is known as retrograde movement, which hopefully makes logical sense. If the movement were going from the spinal cord to the periphery in the opposite direction, this would be known as anterograde movement. From the image, notice that a cross section of the spinal cord is shown, and right at the anterior horn, you can see the motor neuron and interneuron. I've shown this whole part zoomed up right here, so it'll be easier to see. So here is the motor neuron, and here is the interneuron. The interneuron is also known as a Renshaw cell. Once the toxin reaches the anterior horn, it travels from the motor neuron to the Renshaw cell. Notice that within the Renshaw cell are vesicles containing the neurotransmitters GABA and glycine. These vesicles normally interact with snare proteins, which you can see right here. The snare proteins are responsible for releasing GABA and glycine into the synapse, where the neurotransmitters can then inhibit the motor neuron. However, when tetanospasm enters the Renshaw cell, it cleaves the snare proteins, which prevents the release of GABA and glycine, which we've shown right here with this inhibition sign. So by decreasing GABA and glycine, the muscle becomes disinhibited or overly active, which is why the muscles are overstimulated, resulting in increased muscle tone. Okay, now that you understand the mechanism here, let's return to the image and help you memorize these details. Notice that this monster is snared down to the ground with these ropes. The snare here represents the snare proteins. So as we just learned, the toxin cleaves snare proteins. In this image, this monster's name is Gabe. Notice that his coffin is appropriately labeled Gabe. This is to help you remember that GABA is one of the affected neurotransmitters. Also notice that Gabe happens to be floating in the air as if he's gliding in an upward motion. This is because the necromancer is using his magic to cause Gabe to fly in the air. This gliding upward motion is to help you remember that glycine is the other neurotransmitter that's affected. So glide for glycine. Okay, notice that we've added a cool looking serrated sword to our necromancer. It's serrated kind of like a saw, which is a reference to the Renshaw cell. We've also added some rusty nails on the necromancer's robe to help you remember that clostridium tetani spores are commonly found on rusty nails. This is why a rusty nail puncture wound commonly precedes the clinical presentation of clostridium tetani. Notice that the skeleton is holding a syringe very tightly in his hand. The clenched hand here represents that clostridium tetani can also cause clenched hands. The syringe in the skeleton's hand is used to represent that clostridium tetani can be prevented with the tetanus vaccine. We'll continue to use this syringe symbol to represent vaccines. It's especially important for pregnant women to receive the vaccination because they can provide transplacental IgG to the developing fetus, which can prevent neonatal infection. This is especially important in developing countries where unhygienic deliveries and cord care may be more common. So remember this syringe in conjunction with the belly ring on the other monster and that vaccinating pregnant women can decrease neonatal infection. Finally, look at the gate behind the necromancer. Did you notice that the entrance to the gate and the top of the gate is lined with these little immunoglobulins? This is a reference to tetanus immune globulin. For step one, you need to know that tetanus immune globulin can be given to treat an acute infection. This is because human tetanus immune globulin binds to the tetanus toxin, which can neutralize any remaining unbound toxin. Okay, now that we've covered the image, Let's wrap up this section with a question. A 13-year-old unvaccinated boy presents to the emergency department due to involuntary muscle contractions. Physical examination reveals neck stiffness, clenched hands, and a decreased ability to open his jaw. The organism most likely responsible for this patient's symptoms produces a toxin that cleaves what protein? Hopefully from the question stem, you notice that this boy is presenting with signs and symptoms consistent with Clostridium tetani. The fact that he's unvaccinated and is having involuntary muscle contractions should immediately make you think of Clostridium tetani. The decreased ability to open his jaw is alluding to lockjaw, which is a dead giveaway. As we just discussed, this organism produces tetanospasm, which cleaves snare proteins. So the answer is snare proteins. From the picture, remember that this monster is snared down by these dirty ropes, which represent snare proteins. From the overview figure of tetanospasm, we can see the snare proteins right here. 